Well, I think for the sake of time that we uh, should just uh, start. Uh, I would expect uh, people from my address to, uh, uh, to join as well uh, during this meeting, but uh, well, let's see. Um, Antonucci uh, asked us, uh, me and uh, Saskia, to present uh, during this meeting about the translational research part in pediatrics. So I'm Tessa van der Geest and I'm a biologist by training and now I'm a project manager uh, in three different European projects, all focusing on improving medicines in children. So this variates from the translational part uh, up to trial management and uh, clinical trials. So uh, within the uh, translational part, we have been working together with the Iatris people uh, well, to improve the translational research, not only in the Netherlands, but in, uh, in the whole of Europe, and uh, to find out how to work together uh, to, uh, to improve these, uh, uh, this infra infrastructure and to find out the needs uh, that are uh, unmet up till now. So today I would like to uh, well, give a very short uh, introduction of EATRIS um, and uh, of pediatrics and why these separate uh, services are, uh, are needed. Um, and we will focus on the development, uh, development of pharmacology and the pharmacology because uh, that's uh, uh, our field of expertise. Uh, and uh, uh, I will show some available services that are uh, already here uh, and uh, to show that there is some infrastructure already. And after that, I'm very pleased to give the floor to Birgit Koch. Um, she's also present here already, uh, and she's working at the Department of Pharmacy at the Erasmus UMC and will focus on pharmacometrics. Uh, and she will have uh, uh, some examples uh, of uh, uh, specific techniques, um, both for adults and for children as well. So EATVIS is the European Infrastructure for Translational Medicine, which aims to improve and accelerate the translation of biomedical research into the clinic um, and uh, uh, for patient benefit. And they support both um, academia, industry, patients, and uh, policy makers in this. So they want to fasten up the progress of translational medicines up to uh, the clinics and uh, will make sure the patient benefits most of it. So structural wise, it is a non-profit organization with a legal status of an ERIC. So they represent a lot of European countries and research institute, and they have created five scientific platforms uh, in which they provide services and develop their expertise as a bank. So uh, Elaine, of course, uh, is part of uh, one of these uh, scientific uh, platforms. So happy to have you here as well. So these are uh, the services uh, and expertise that they uh, provide and they work in. Um, although these platforms are not specifically created for, uh, for pediatrics or based on the pediatric needs, all of them show elements that can be used within the pediatric research as well. So in our group, we uh, are focused on the development of pharmacology and we are mostly involved in the platforms of imaging and tracers with our microdosing studies um, and in the, the field of small molecules and small samples. But of course, uh, research regarding vaccines for children uh, are also relevant, especially in, in these times uh, with the COVID-19 uh, vaccines coming up. So we see a lot of uh, trials coming up here as well. And of course, work, uh, translational work that has been done uh, before this uh, is also partly uh, based on pediatric needs. So a lot of techniques are more or less the same for children as for adults. However, uh, pediatric specific elements need to be taken into account in every step of the way and should, well, in our opinion, at least, be implemented in uh, research infrastructures uh, such as um, uh, EATRIS, but also in, the, uh, for instance, BBMRI for their, uh, the, bio, uh, the bio bank, uh, which seems quite obvious, but uh, haven't been, well, there yet. Uh, uh, in a way that we uh, we would like to. So 
Um, if the infrastructure like Iatris is there, why is it needed that uh, some attention is given to uh, the pediatric specific expertise as services? Well, um, first of all, still at least 30% of the medication prescribed to children is provided off label. So this uh, actually means that these drugs are not properly tested in, uh, for instance, appropriate age groups um, or in the correct indications. And these percentages even increase in rare diseases and uh, seriously ill children, even up to 80% of the, of the medicine. So this leads to a serious lack of well-tested medication for children. And of course, uh, new medicines are tested in children, uh, but also the older uh, medicines are not well tested and mostly given uh, based on experience or uh, um, adult data and that's not uh, how we would like to see it and of course it's well known now that children are not just small adults and that their biology is uh, significantly different from the adult so that leads to different processing of administered drugs um, and it has been widely shown that using adult doses um, even if corrected for weight often is insufficient and that's what's been done um, well, as from decades ago, um, either resulting in low blood levels, too low blood levels and uh, inefficiency of the drug, or too low blood levels and uh, or too high blood levels actually, and serious um, adverse events. So although new drugs are tested, um, especially since regulation in 2007, the use of pediatric specific techniques often stay behind well as the availability of pediatric specific tools and services to be used in the phases prior to clinical trials. So creating an infrastructure to enable decent research is one of the steps to be taken in, uh, into account to get uh, to effective and safe treatments for children. So that's why we've been working on the development of pediatric platforms um, in uh, one of our European uh, project, um, which already uh, should show uh, available pediatric services, um, which were mapped in this in this project, but also uh, specific needs that were still lacking. So within our group, we were involved in the developmental pharmacology platforms, and uh, within this platform, we aim to well create a bridge between the basic research and clinical drug development uh, in this field. So um, once new drugs candidate have been selected, um, these data should um, ex be uh, extrapolated from adult data to pediatric data. And this is not as easy as it, uh, as it might sound. And uh, this is limited by age related variation in the biological process, as I saw, said before. Um, but also uh, some other challenges need to be addressed. So in the field of developmental pharmacology, um, uh, it plays this, these uh, uh, topics play, play in well, quite an important role to close information gaps that are already there and were not um, identified yet. Uh, and um, what we especially focus upon were the pharmacodynamics and the ph pharmacokinetics in which we can learn a lot, but also a lot have been developed already. So within this platform, we try to provide access to researchers from, uh, well, both academia and industry um, to get to research infrastructure such as EATIS to support their studies and to find the optimal pediatric dose and safety platform, uh, safety uh, uh, for these new drugs. And it ranges from laboratories providing access to, uh, well, age-related uh, variation in absorption, distribution, uh, metabolism and excretion to find out um, which services are there and which techniques are suitable for pediatrics, as well as the development of uh, physiologically based and PKPD models addressing and elucidating the um, ontogeny using modeling and simulation. 
also the development of sensitive analytical assays for pharmacokinetic studies, uh, like um, dry blood spot, um, as well as the microdosing studies, which are very uh, nice and, and important uh, um, techniques to be used in children to, uh, to well, get into the clinics. So this slide actually shows that, that even only uh, in the Netherlands as shown here, these specific services are already available, but you need to know where to look. And some of these examples of services provided within our network would very much profit from a pediatric infrastructure, uh, maybe built into the uh, infrastructure of EATRIS uh, or something alike, uh, or just uh, a, a pediatric um, uh, infrastructure on itself, um, or, or just a, a pillar within the existing uh, infrastructure. So that's something that we can discuss later on, what would be the most um, uh, maybe pragmatic way to uh, to continue and implement the pediatrics within the infrastructures or to go on uh, by, by itself. So these techniques are all pediatric specific or needed for research in, uh, in, the, uh, in the field of pediatrics. For instance, uh, the Amsterdam EMC uh, are developing radio traces, which can be used for the microdosing. And of course, the development of radio traces is not specific, pediatric specific um, by itself, but uh, well, the experience and, and the knowledge regarding the microdosing part is very, very limited within, uh, um, within the field. So it's, it's good to have a good partner on this. Uh, and this together with, uh, with collaboration with TNO, um, uh, with the, the AMS, it's, it's a very uh, valuable collaboration. You should know uh, who to contact and where to find them. Um, and for instance, as well, the dry blood spots uh, is also not uh, pediatric specific, but drawing extra blood for children is uh, is often a burden that that we would like. Uh, well, what we see is undesirable. So uh, this is a technique which is uh, used uh, uh, quite a lot in pediatrics, and it's also uh, good to know where to find um, expertise in this and how to use and how to well, gain the most of knowledge out of it. Um, as well as the, the modeling and simulation experts um, who play a very, very important role in the PKPD and pop PK uh, studies, which we also do in Radboud, but also uh, uh, in, uh, in the LLMC. So these are the people that we uh, worked in, in our work with in our uh, European uh, group, and, we, uh, and also with previous uh, well, uh, clinical uh, and preclinical work. So we, uh, Saskia, at least worked a lot with uh, with TNO and Amsterdam for microdosing studies, as well as with uh, Miriam Moy, who was also involved in in the European part uh, of uh, of our project. Um, and I would like to uh, to well give the VSOP some some attention here as well because they. This is uh, the patient uh, uh, organization of, uh, for rare diseases, but they are very much involved in all kinds of European projects and uh, really think along in uh, a way to involve patients also uh, in preclinical and translational parts of how, uh, how this can be improved. So uh, they, uh, they can uh, use a thank you as well. And of course, Birgit, who uh, who is here to uh, tell something about the pharmacometrics um, and who I would like to give the floor to uh, as, as well, Bernabé. So uh, thank you for um, well listening to me and I uh, um, have one last slide that, uh, that's also very uh, important, but it's also good to, uh, to just show uh, that there are other um, organizations as well who would like to uh, to uh, have some influence and to uh, to support children uh, well research in children and this is a good good bill which uh, supports um, uh, several pro uh, projects um, regarding uh, uh, medicines in children so they uh, 
there are people with uh, quite a lot of private money and uh, they tend to, uh, to, to well, give projects, projects a chance that are too small or too, well, uh, important, but not, not well supported yet. So that's a very good thing. So Saskia also uh, um, is part of um, uh, their advisory group as, a, as an expert, a clinical expert here. So I would like to show that as well. So Birgit, I um, invite you to share your screen and to uh, uh, well enlighten us uh, about the pharmacometric part of it. Thank you very much, Tessa. Uh, let's see. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So thank you for, uh, very much for the opportunity to, to, to inform you on the work we do here in a nice collaboration on model informed precision dosing, dosing in pediatric patients. And I will tell, it's only 10 minutes, but I will tell a little bit on applying clinical pharmacometrics, scavenger TDM, and also using alternative matrices. Um, I'm, um, as uh, Tessa already told you, I'm a hospital pharmacist, clinical pharmacologist, associate professor in um, clinical pharmacometrics, and I work in the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. This is actually the hospital I work in, and all of you know it probably. It's one of the largest academic hospitals here in the Netherlands. And um, we also have a very large uh, pediatric hospital, the Sophia Children's Hospital. And um, as a hospital pharmacist, I work a lot with uh, the pediatrics in uh, the hospital, with the patients in the hospital. And we have a lot of collaborations, as Tessa already told you, with the other hospitals in our country. So what are our patients? And I think that all of you not, might know is that we have lots of different patients. We have uh, patients with different weights. We have uh, patients who are not um, small adults. We have patients with uh, renal replacement therapy or other devices thereon or we have patients who are intensive care patients or patients who are older. And then most drugs are only developed in um, young male adults. And uh, these are not the patients we see in our clinical practice. So how to actually continue and actually make the dosing of patients better? Because we see a lot of side effects. We see not optimal dosing. And we see antibiotic resistance, for example, and I think we can do better. And that's why I think model informed precision dosing is so important. Um, and what is it and what's the status? Yeah, as all of you know, know is that pharmacometrics, so pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics combined, uses uh, patient properties, uses drug properties, and, uh, and it uh, works together to make a PKPD model. So to actually have um, uh, a knowledge on the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics, and also what the drug does to the body, and also what kind of effect you can relate to the dosing and the concentration of a drug. And I think if you look at this slide, and it's a nice slide showing the outline of PKPD modeling, is that on the left, we're actually pretty okay. We make a lot of models, but I think we have to go to the right part of the slide. We have to validate it in clinical practice and we have to implement them. And I think that's the last thing is especially very important that we actually uh, go to a precision dosing that every patient gets its optimal dose. And especially in children, this is very important. So if you look at uh, normal practice, we uh, make a PKPD model and then you get a dosing algorithm based on the patient characteristics. And we um, use this uh, dosing algorithm and the therapeutic window we get from therapeutic drug, drug monitoring to actually uh, individualize the dose of a patient. If you look at this slide, you see on the upper side what we normally do. We have a standard dose and then we do therapeutic drug monitoring. So most often we measure a concentration in the blood of a patient. Then we have to we know if it's in a therapeutic window or not. Then we adjust the dose based on these concentrations and we try to optimize it as good as possible. Uh, what I think is the thing to go for in the future is that you individualize, individualize the dose um, in the beginning. So we have a patient. Uh, we have the PKPD model, uh, we uh, uh, have all the patient characteristics, and we try to optimize the dose as soon as possible. And then afterwards, we do therapeutic drug monitoring and adjust the dose uh, again and again so to even improve the dose of a patient. And I think that's uh, what clinical pharmacometrics is about. It's not on making PKPD models, I think these are important, but I think the most important thing is that we actually implement them in clinical practice and make drug dosing better.
for patients. So our pharmacy facilities, because that's, a, I think Saskia and Tessa would uh, wanted me to tell you a little bit about, that's my group. And we have uh, actually two things I wanted to sh share with you. We have quite a large laboratory in which we have technicians working with lots of equipment on a, a mass spectrometry, but also chromatography. Uh, we uh, analyze a lot of drugs every uh, day and year. And we have uh, lots of assays uh, validated according to uh, FDA or EMA. And we do both therapeutic drug monitoring, toxicology, and at the moment, since two years, we also do forensic toxicology because we also want to know uh, what the drug, how the drug reacts or what the concentration of the drug is after death. I think that's also important sometimes to know what the cause of death is in a patient. And nowadays we do approximately thousand samples every year uh, getting from patients who died. And there's a question about how they died and what the concentration of drug was in our body. Um, we uh, started to uh, go to alternative sampling a couple of years ago. First, we did only did urine and blood, which are the normal conventional uh, uh, matrices. But now we do dry blood spots, and I will tell you a little bit about that later on. Synovial fluid, which is important in, in uh, orthopedics to see if the target site concentration is correct in uh, orthopedic surgery. We also do meconium, um, in which we want to know if uh, drugs actually um, uh, have access to the um, baby. And um, we do placenta research, in which we want to know what the transfer is from a mother to a uh, baby uh, with regards to drugs or other uh, kinds of um, uh, um, stuff. Um, and um, the second part I, uh, of my research group is on clinical pharmacometrics. We have a research team with including 12 PhD students who do a lot of modeling, uh, non-compartmental and compartmental with non-MEM and P-metrics, but also other software in which we try to improve and uh, patients dosing in clinical practice. So my focus is really not to uh, make models, but you really apply them in clinical practice. And I wanted to show you three examples of the things we do and we have done the last couple of years. And it's on clinical pharmacometrics, sustainable TDM and alternative matrices. And the first one is actually uh, an example in adult patients. These are the two PhD students who are on the project. It's called the expat in the dolphin study, and it's a, there are large intensive care uh, studies in eight intensive cares in the Netherlands. Um, and what we started with a couple of years ago is that we wanted to know if the uh, antibiotic exposure in uh, intensive care patients was good enough. And we started the expat study in which, uh, which uh, fluoroquinolones and beta-lactones, which are the most used antibiotics in the intensive care, we wanted to know how the exposure was, what, what are patients getting enough dose of the antibiotics. So we started with the expert study and we found out that uh, lots of patients, approximately half of the patients, um, the exposure on antibiotics was not good enough. So we had to do better. So that's why we started the dolphin study, which is a large study in eight intensive care patient, eight intensive care units in the Netherlands, in which we compare model-based dosing, so PKPD models we made, uh, and then we com um, actually compare them with traditional dosing. So we compare traditional standard dosing with uh, model in informed precision dosing on these drugs. And we make the models, of, we use the models from earlier research or from our infrastructure or network uh, we have developed. And I think it's good that we use this infrastructure because it shows you that you can, if you work together, you can get better results. So now this is a randomized clinical trial with 450 patients we have to include. And we actually are now at patient 402. So that's almost completed. And we look at target attainment to see if we have indeed in the model informed precision dosing group enough uh, exposure of the antibiotic and the primary clinical income is uh, intensive care length of stay. So it's important to also choose a primary outcome which is um, clinical relevant. Uh, after that, we started the expat kids study, which is a target attainment study of beta lactam antibiotics in the pediatric intensive care. And what is, what's interesting about this is that we use scavenger TDM. Uh, we don't want to um, get uh, a lot of blood from the children, especially babies, because that's not necessary. And also it's quite difficult to get. So we try to do this with blood gas, blood gas residuals, which is um, uh, material with, which is actually already were drawn and we use the residuals, which is just normally drawn away, just thrown away uh, in garbage. And we use them to actually uh, measure the beta-lactam antibiotic levels in these uh, uh, blood residuals. And it's also nice because it's also a collaboration with uh, the Radboud, say to see if we indeed find that uh, the 
target attainment of beta lactam antibiotics in pediatrics is the same as in the adults, or maybe it's even better or worse. And we uh, and after that, we actually want to go to more to an intervention study to see if we can do better with model informed precision doting. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you uh, is precision dosing of antipsychotics in children with autism. And this is Bart, and Bart is a, a young uh, boy, he's eight years old, and he has autism. And the only thing he has is that he has behavioral problems. So he has to use antipsychotics to actually um, relieve him from his behavioral problems. Um, and the thing is with these antipsychotics, uh, for example, risperidon, is that they work pretty well. They are quite effect effective, but they also have a lot of side effects. If you look at um, uh, 10 uh, children, two of them will get a lot of weight gain after uh, receiving risperidon, and it can even go up to 10 kilograms. Um, and that's uh, quite difficult for children, but especially in the end, they will get a uh, risk on uh, developing metabolic syndrome, but also on diabetes in, um, at the end. So I think it's important to, to uh, decrease this uh, side effect and to go to an optimal dose of antipsychotics. So that's why a couple of years ago, we started a space study, which is a large study in uh, the southwest of the Netherlands, in which we included uh, children starting with risperidon, aripiprazole, and pipamparon. These are the two, three uh, most used antipsychotics. And we wanted to know if the DBS, so the dry blood spot, we, you can see them on the left side, uh, we can um, redraw blood, uh, and that can be done easily from home, and it's also quite feasible. We did a feasibility study, and all uh, children said it was really nice and was uh, less uh, um, problematic than actually do a vein puncture. puncture. So we uh, included DB DBS and we included effective analysis and also side effect analysis. And we wanted to know if we can in indeed find a therapeutic window in, uh, for example, risperidon showing um, effective treatment. So actually getting less behavioral problems, but also having less side effects. So having less weight gain. And I think that's important. So on the right side, you can see Sonne. Sonne is the PhD student who just finished her thesis and she did incredible, nice work. And what she found is that there is indeed a therapeutic window for risperidon. And now we're actually starting to uh, include this in a new study. It's called the Space to Star study in which we uh, include two groups. One is getting the normal fixed dosing as a uh, we have done for years and the other one is getting the model informed precision dosing with therapeutic drug monitoring to indeed uh, show and find hopefully that we get um, less side effects using this uh, model informed precision dosing and the other thing we've uh, conclu concluded from the um, uh, space study is that we get a, can ha have a better uh, dosing regimen for pipamparon and that actually has been um, uh, incorporated in the Dutch Kinder Pharma line. So I think that's also a great success of this nice study. Um, I think the uh, last thing I wanted to show you is that uh, if we make models, uh, you, we can use them. And I think most physicians want the models to be uh, as easy as possible to access. So that's why now we are starting to make dashboards for the physicians here in the hospital to, that they actually uh, can uh, figure out for themselves what the model informed precision dosing is and we also are starting a project here it's called first uh, time right in, in which we want to implement our models into the hospital system that actually the doctor gets an advice um, with the patient characteristics how to dose the patient uh, as uh, individualized as possible and, uh, and also as good as possible from the start of the therapy so uh, some of, of the things I, um, I'm doing at the moment, so um, I hope I, I showed you some uh, possibilities of clinical pharmacometrics and also therapeutic drug monitoring and dosing algorithms. I think it's essential to have a good collaboration, a good network and a good infrastructure for these things, because I think if you really want to uh, conclude and make a good uh, have a good results of our studies. I think that collaboration in, in this pediatric uh, patients is very important. So a network and infrastructure is, uh, I think it's essential. I also showed you that the possibility of the possibilities of therapeutic drug monitoring in uh, alter alternative matrices, but also in scavenger to show, to use as, uh, as um, uh, less material and also use residual material. So actually don't have a lot of blood withdrawal. 
Uh, and the next things are, we are going to do is look at target site monitoring to see what the concentration is at the target site, look at biosensors, and also really want to implement it in clinical practice. So um, I hope I showed you some of the things I'm doing and what we're doing in our network. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Brigitte. I think uh, they want us to get back in the network app to uh, follow the rest of, uh, of the session. So thank you very much. And uh, 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 people can address questions to me uh, and uh, I will pick them up with, uh, with Brigitte if, uh, if necessary. So thank you very much and enjoy uh, the rest of the, of the sessions uh, of this afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Brigitte. Thank you. Thank you.